something. Lots of something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> lots of something. Uh, lots of something. Okay. I'm here to talk about NTPSET, which is a new project to produce a version of Internet Time Service that doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, by not sucking, I specifically not mean, I, I mean not being a DDoS amplifier for every nasty cracker on the planet. I don't know how many of you are NTP administrators, but some of you might be aware that this is not historically a significant problem with NTP. How many people are going to get this here? You have. Okay, so you know about it. All right, so the way this project got started was I have a friend who's an InfoSec researcher, and said friend, uh, raised the alarm in late 2014. He noticed that this DDoS amplification problem was starting to be a big deal. Later, I find out from uh, found out from another one of my colleagues that 50% um, of the MTP packets on the network are attack packets. So it's a it's a high volume problem. She uh, noticed that this was a problem. She went to the National Science Foundation and said. Uh, hey ho, critical infrastructure vulnerability, national scope, this is a problem. NSF <coughs> looked at her report, did a little digging of its own, and hit the panic button. They approved a seed grant for a rescue of the code in two days. When have you ever heard of the federal government doing anything in two days? I've heard bathroom breaks in so they gave my friend Susan $5,000 in a mandate. She did, they said, go find a tech team and start on this problem. We'll scare up more funding later. Um, Susan didn't know who to call, so she called me. <laughs> this was actually a reasonable thing to do, as it turns out, because although at the time I knew very well about time service, I had been working for eight years, eight to 10 years on GPSD which is a very close partner of NTPD. Uh, one of the things that you, uh, you can do with a GPSD, if you have it, is there's a special driver called SH, SN, SHM, the shared memory driver, that's designed so you can couple it to an NTPD and use it to feed GPS samples to the time demon so that you have a primary time server you have your own, you have your own local clock. So I knew a little bit about time service, and my chief lieutenant, uh, on GPSD, a guy named Garrett Miller, knows more than I do, knew more than I do, still knows more than I do. He's a real domain expert on time service. I'm not. Um, what I am is a systems architect, and they needed a systems architect because the code, and it turned out the security problems were only the tip of an iceberg. What we were looking at here was, okay, I'll say a basically did sound design that it had Craft accumulated on top of it for a quarter century. I, I see you're nodding your head. You just, what did you know about this before I started talking? Well, I know Mills. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> you know Dave Mills. I have never met the man. Uh, okay, down at the University of Delaware. Um, so we understand. Rumor has it, let me say something about Dave Mills. Dave Mills was a brilliant systems architect. The design of, of, of NTP is fundamentally quite sound. Unfortunately, he seems to have stopped learning system architecture around 1995. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I looked at the code, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking through this and I'm going, well, there's, so there's, there's a quarter century of craft uh, on this, but fundamentally, it looks like really good state-of-the-art Unix systems code for the late 1990s before anybody really worried about security or, or any of the whole cluster of issues related to that. So we needed to do something. We needed to do serious code hard. Uh, but we had a problem, which is that I don't know anything about the time service. But, um, Today, are thinking what to do, what to do. I will lean on my time service experts. What am I going to do in the meantime? And then I remembered a famous quote by um, Z.A.R. Hoare to the effect that there are two ways to design software. One is to make it so simple that there are obviously no defects. And the other is to make it so complex that the defects are not obvious. 
Uh, what Hora was suggesting in modern terms is that if you want to fix security problems or any other kind of engineering problem with a, a large piece of software, the first thing to do is strip off all the crap. Get rid of everything that doesn't absolutely need to be there. So I started stripping crap. Um, I'll give you the bottom line number first. We started out with 207, uh, 227 kilobytes, 227,000 lines of C. We are now down to 72. That is a 65, 66 percent reduction in volatility. Now I'll tell you how we did that. Some way we did that was uh, the first thing I noticed when I looked at the code was that it was full of port shims for big iron unixes that had not been seen to walk the earth since the late Cretaceous. <laughs> I mean, I, a lot of you probably remember those days, but they were long ago now. I mean, sequence, Dynex, not so, Sonos, not Solaris, but Sonos. There were all kinds of, of, of uh, there was a thick jungle, jungle of port shims in there. And it was doing two things. One, it was bulking up the code. And another thing it was doing was making it very difficult to read. If you can't read the code, you really can't harden it very effectively. So job one was to get rid of all that crap. And the first major decision we made um, was to move, was to strip away everything, basically, that didn't conform to, um, to POSIX 2001 and, and ANSI C99. Get, a, get rid of everything older, get rid of all the, the system specific interfaces, with one very small group of exceptions, which is that the particular system calls that you use to manipulate the clock are not positive standardized. These are the small group of calls, um, edge time and edge time X. Those aren't positive standardized, so you can't get rid of those or your software doesn't work. But with that exception, throw out everything that isn't POSIX and C99. That reduced the bulk of the code a whole lot. The next thing we did was hunt for features that were obsolete. Um, the people who had been maintaining this code, the Network Time Foundation, had an internal culture that, um, well, I'll be kind and say it was inertia written. They were frightened of throwing away everything. They had this belief that if they, they touched the slightest ancient feature, some legacy user would come screaming out of a corner and destroy them. Uh, you know, and, and maybe for them that was true, but um, we made the strategic decision early on because security was, was, was going to be a priority, so we were going to harden the code, don't make the time behind most, and anyway, the people we were thinking of as core customers are people running modern equipment in large data centers. <coughs> We're not really targeting people who are still running Sonos. I'm sorry, there are a few of those out there, but we made a basic early decision that we don't care. So we threw out all the old port chins, we threw out all the system specific stuff from before standardization, and then we started throwing out obsolete clock drivers. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, NTPD does two different things. One, it, is, it acts as a relay between different NTPDs, lower stratum once closer to clocks and higher stratum once closer to people. <coughs> and that part of NTPD is, is a, a, a network facing game that was a bunch of statistical time sync algorithms in it, trying to make the best sense out of the input it gets and pass on that best sense further down the stratum. Uh, the other thing that NTPD does for historical reasons it also manages local clocks for you if you have them. Things like GPSs and GPSDOs and cesium count fountain clocks if you're a national time authority and has one of those. Um, but the result of this history was that the, uh, and the fact that uh, clock technology has been changing rather rapidly over the last couple of decades, is that there were large numbers of drivers in the clock drivers and TPD that were completely obsolete. But NTF had never removed because they never removed things. It was just kind of a rule for them. So we dropped all in. Now you're beginning to get an idea how we got a 60 to 6 percent code reduction. Then we went looking for features that were obsolete or didn't work. Things like, for example, 
there's a utility called NTPQ, which you can use to query the state of your local NTPD, ask it for statistics, ask it who it's talking to. Uh, oh, well, what some of you may not know is that there's, there was an entire second utility called NTPDC that did pretty much the same things. The only significant functional difference was NTPD was written with a, a binary transaction protocol instead of a textual one. Why? I don't know. I, can, I cannot figure out who ever thought this was a good idea, but it wasn't a good idea. I'll tell you one reason it wasn't a good idea was because the, uh, the handling for that binary code, mode, eight, uh, mode 7, was a notorious bug attractor. A large percentage of the CDEs that were issued against Classic had something to do with that protocol. So we ripped it out and just removed it completely. We didn't have to worry about that because we figured pretty much everybody in the world was either using NTPQ, mode 6, or could move to it without experiencing significant pain. So we dropped it. Another thing we dropped is auto key. This was a public key encryption scheme for security communications um, uh, between NTPDs. Um, and it had the problem that it was tremendously complicated and didn't work. Uh, Mills had tinkered with it perpetually and could never quite get it to interoperate with, with different versions to interoperate with each other. And there's a plaintive comment or we found early on in the source where, where Arlen Stem was saying, would anybody who's actually using auto key successfully please contact us? Uh, and they're here again, you know, you're going to start to see a pattern here. This piece of cruft that didn't quite work was a major defect attractor. There were lots of CDEs that were directly related not just to using auto key, but having auto key in the code at all, even if you weren't using it. So we dropped it. We were pretty ruthless about what we eliminated. Um, and we started to see, I was actually, I actually spent a year being really worried about this because this was the only, not being a time domain expert, not being a crypto expert, not being an infosec expert, I am none of these things. I know how to talk to people who know that stuff. But I'm not an expert in any of those these domains. All I, knew how, how, all I know how to do is system architecture and, and refactoring and, and refactoring and clean code. And the possibility that worried me for a year was maybe I was like that, that drunk in the old joke. Um, you know, the one where a policeman finds a, a drunk scrabbling around at the base of the street line. Says, what you doing? The drunk says, I'm looking for my keys. And the, uh, uh, and the drunk says, oh, two streets over, uh, officer. And the officer says, why are you looking here? Because that's in the dark and I can't see. <laughs> I was afraid I might be like, like that drunk, you know, scrabbling around the base of the street light because that's all I knew how to do. Then, um, January, February of this year, we started having whole batches of CDEs come in against classic security alerts coming in against that code base. And they didn't affect us because we ripped out the stuff that made us vulnerable. <laughs> So that's what told us that it was working. When, our, when, when it got to the point where we were dodging 75% of the incoming bullets because we'd already removed that code, that's when you know that reducing the tax surface is really working. Uh, and that process is still ongoing. Um, one of the things I'm working on right now is NTPQ, which I mentioned before. It's this huge, nasty, ugly lump of C that basically exists to exchange uh, protocol packets with a running NTPD and turn them into reports and statistics and stuff. There's no good reason this needs to be written in C. None at all. There's no reason to, to tolerate the maintenance overhead from writing something like, like that in a language where you get constant buffer overruns and, and crap like that. I'm translating into Python. The work is quite far along. Um, the, due to a happy coincidence in the way the interface of NTPD was designed, it's very likely that I will translate it into Python and nobody will ever notice. <laughs> because the, uh, the, the line oriented interface uh, for uh, NTPQ happens to look almost exactly what, like what the Python CMD CMD class provides out of the box. Just weird coincidence. Um, so I'll get NTPQ translated to Python. It will be invulnerable to buffer overflows. It will be a lot shorter. It will be a lot simpler. It will be a lot easier to maintain. And I will get to drop another 6K lock of C out of the code base. And that's a good thing. 
Um, other things that we are thinking about, we have, I'm not a crypto specialist, but I have a crypto specialist, a brilliant guy named Daniel Frankie, uh, who is a uh, senior security guy at Akamai, and he's not working on our toys. Um, he is working with the IETF on NTS, which they do, encryption standard for secure, secure communication. Uh, he's already written some of the draft RFCs and is going to be heavily involved in writing more. Uh, and I expect that we will be either the first or the second interoperable implementation for the, uh, the new security stuff. Um, also, we have some speculative stuff going on on how to actually improve um, time sync performance. And I'll talk a little, little bit more about how that works in a moment. Um, Daniel uh, thinks that we may be able to do a better job of compensating for network weather by uh, noticing uh, conditions around us. Uh, let me talk about that for a bit. Now, having, um, uh, having laid out some of the, the history and the background here, oh, before I go any further, um, I am interruptible. If you are tremendously puzzled by something I just said, raise a hand for some of these phone signal and I will try and answer questions. So do not consider that I am monologuing up here. That's only for super villains. Uh, and I'm not in super villain mode at the moment. Thank you. Um, so uh, where was I? Yes. Uh, time sync. Uh, now I'll explain a little bit about how this works for those of you who may not be aware. Um, you have a computer. You want to know what universal coordinated time is. There are other kinds of time sync problems, but this would stand for all of them. You, you want to know what type it is UTC. Um, internally, you have a clock crystal, which vibrates at a not what, what is nominally a fixed rate. In theory, if it was actually a fixed rate, you could set your clock once and have an accurate clock for the rest of the time because the crystal vibrates at a fixed rate. And of course, you've got a little lithium coin cell battery on the board, so it keeps vibrating when the computer's going. Unfortunately, that's not the real world. In the real world, uh, the little quartz crystals in your machine suffer frequency drift. Um, the main driver of that frequency drift, we thought until recently that was temperature. That is the, the uh, uh, that's, but there's some interesting statistical evidence we're turning up that that may not be as important as everybody thought it was. Anyway, there is a diurnal cycle of frequency variations, which you tend to see in, in, uh, in these crystals, with just enough randomness uh, in it that you can't really model it and cancel it out. We used to think it was temperature. Now, one of our guys is thinking it may actually be ionospheric weather due to the, the hemocide layer uh, uh, rising and falling. How that influences a crystal at ground level, we don't know yet. But it's, it's, it's one possible correlation. Um, anyway, um, or maybe I got, got that wrong. Maybe he's talking about GPS variations. They're, they're, they're difficult to disentangle if you're using GPS in the clock. Anyway, so there are various sources of drift. Uh, temperature is one. Uh, atmospheric pressure is another. If you drop or stress your crystal, its vibration range will, will change slightly. So every time your PC goes clunk, <laughs> the frequency is going to you know, jut or something. Uh, because the clock crystal has unpredictable drift, you need to resync with a known good time source uh, every once in a while in order to really continue tracking the UTC. Unfortunately, this is a problem because you're on a network. All of your time sources are over network links. The network links have variable delay. You can't predict the variable delay except, that you, well, you can't predict it only watch it and try to form statistical models. So you don't know how far away uh, the, uh, the your 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 hosts your other machines are in network seconds. So what you need to do, it turns out there is a way around this problem and it's the one that David Mills invented. He came up with this ferociously clever Byzantine algorithm where you watch a whole bunch of <coughs> of, um, of upstream servers you try and notice when they have near constant offsets and gradually compensate off the offset. And then you then you, uh, you look for the servers with the lowest jitter, throw out the ones with the highest jitter, and do a sort of statistical centroid approximation thing with the, the cle 
something that seems to be close together. And you take the, the center of that centroid and you call it, this is the best approximation of UTC I'm going to get. This turns out to work rather well uh, on modern networks. Performance used to be worse, but on modern networks, you can generally count on uh, tracking uh, time down to 10 milliseconds precision or so. Um, over, a, over a LAN or in a controlled environment, you can do better. I'm primarily concerned with wide area network service. Um, over a LAN or a controlled environment, you probably shouldn't be using NTP at all. You should be using something else called PTP, which I don't know anything about except to point over there and say that's what you want to use. Um, so um, one of the things that we're looking at down the road is I, I, I hand waved when I said um, do a statistical cluster analysis uh, on the incoming data about um, the different clocks. And you have to do this because sometimes clocks are broken and another possibility in our paranoid world is that they might be lying to you. There are various things that an adversary could do to you to mess you over by screwing and suddenly screwing with your time base. There are cryptographic protocols that depend for replay protection on having a common time base with what they're communicating. So somebody who can screw with your time exactly the right way might be able to open a window where they can run a replay attack on something you don't want tagged. That's why this is critical infrastructure. And that's why people like the Department of Homeland Security are mighty interested in the work we're doing. Uh, but we think we may be able to do a better statistical approximation than we're doing now. Uh, we're not ready to tackle that problem yet because there's still cleanup work to be done uh, before we'll have visibility all the way down to the bottom of the algorithms, which I will tell you are rather dense and recondite. I barely understand them at this point. Okay? In fact, we understand them a little better than I do, which is good because somebody needs to do it. Uh, as, again, my job basically is to, is to create a clean, uh, maintainable, hardened code base so that the real domain experts like Gary and, and Daniel go, go, can go in and only worry about the domain specific problems, which is their job to do. Uh, and now I have come to more or less to the end of my prepared rant, um, except to note that um, we're not scheduling a 1.0 release yet, but I think it would be reasonable to expect one in a month to 60 days. Um, one of the reasons I, that's one of the reasons I offered to give this talk right now because it's been two years of very hard work. Yes, it took two years. Two years of very hard work is almost culminating at this point in a, in a, in a ship of a 1.0. Um, oh, I will also say, I mentioned that um, Raspberry Pis would figure in this talk. Um, I have six of them sitting in my office on the windowsill above my desk, which I call the official windowsill of mad science because it's got so many blinking lights. Um, each one of them has a GPS hat on it. And this is my test form. This is where I run stability checks on the code. Um, one of the reasons I have enough confidence to say we'll do 1.0 sooner is because I have now had um, different versions of NTP set running on these machines for months at a time. Um, and in what, over a year of torture testing on these pies, I haven't seen it crash even once. That's the kind of confidence building. <laughs> so, and that's also one of the things that tells you that Mills did a fundamentally uh, sound design because even though I, you know, took, I went after the code with a meat cleaver and chopped away two thirds of it, it still works. It still works. <clears throat> so how difficult is it going to be to configure and then you know, attach it to like Strat 3? Um, no more difficult than it was. You can use the same configuration language that you used to. We haven't changed that. We now offer uh, a better configuration language for talking to clocks than the old one. But the old one is still available. Um, but, the, but certificates, nothing, nothing to, to uh, do the encryption has to be set up? Oh, we, we still support the same symmetric key encryption. That used to be in there. So if you want to if you want to pick a symmetric key and exchange it with your peer, you can do that, and it will all work. So none of that none of that part hasn't changed. It's only auto key, the flaky public key, 
encryption that's gone. Are, are you uh, uh, rec recommending uh, more so the uh, network, uh, uh, the, the disciplining of, of a particular NTP server uh, via the network from another one or via GPS? Uh, it depends on what your needs are. I like having a local clock right. because the network goes all flaky on me. Um, also, they, they, they really kind of complement each other because if you have a local clock, you're going to get more accurate time than the network typically, but the network gets you past times when you have a GPS outage because whatever. And I'm noticing actually more and more interference with GPSs you know, when you drive around. Uh, sometimes GPSs go out because of, uh, of radio frequency interference. <coughs> And there are some people, there are some drivers installing jammers in their trucks for various exactly. reasons. That's exactly. an actual problem. So yeah, you need something to get you past outages, and the network will do that. Yes. Um, what's the difference between, say, Kronos and NTP in your project? Because Kronos is another NTP implementation. I'm just wondering how it compares. That's the first I've heard of it. What, what does it run on? I think it's called Kronos. I hope I'm remembering the name correctly. I was installing a distribution. Oh, Crony! Ah! Is it Crony? Crony, it's Crony. Okay, I'll okay, be talking about it. Right. Uh, Crony is a very nice little piece of software. It does its job quite well. It does a slightly different job from, uh, from NTP. Um, one of my, my chief lieutenant, Gary, who knows more about time service than I am, he's a big fan of Crony. He's trying to get us to adopt as much as possible the good bits of Crony. And I'm not opposing that. Uh, but Crony has a fundamentally different philosophy, where NTP says, there are lots of time sources out there. We know that they're unreliable. Let's take in the noisy input we can get and try and get a best approximation by, by statistical fit to, to the noisy input. Crony has a different philosophy. Crony's philosophy is, somewhere out there, there is one clock that I can trust and I'm going to find it, and I'm going to track it. Um, which is better for your application? Depends partly on the network weather where you are. It may be, in fact, that there's a, a really good clock, clock close to you. Um, but maybe not. I would say for most scenarios, the NTP philosophy is probably superior. But Crony has its place. And it is setting us in some ways a good example. Um, I can talk about some of the other com some of the other com competitive things as well. Um, probably the one. Well, I suppose I can't avoid talking about NTP Classic, which is the code base we forked from. Um, the Network Time Foundation our original rescue plan was to go in with a bunch of money and some technical people and, and fix their code base and basically rescue the project. Unfortunately, that didn't work politically. The guy running the project um, developed this fixated idea that we wanted to take over his project and kick him out, uh, which was uh, that that was crazy because he knew lots of things that we wanted to know and, in fact, still want to know. But he won't talk to us anymore. <laughs> so instead, you forked his project and are making it better and will likely supersede him. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so. He's fulfilling prophecy for the win. It, it's, no, <laughs> no, you laugh, but I actually oh. think this is really tragic. Yeah, no, it's horrible. The, the, um, Harlan has created his own nemesis. Self-fulfilling prophecy? We, we did not want it to, to, to happen this way. Um, uh, the NTF NTP, what we call NTP Classic, is still out there. It's still full of security holes. Uh, it's stagnant because the same interesting personality characteristics that made it difficult for Arlen to work with us made it difficult for him to get anybody else to work on his code. So he's got very few developers. Things move very slowly over there. Uh, and he's really not in the game much anymore. Uh, it, um, NTP Classic is still being distributed by inertia because we haven't shipped a 1.0 release. Uh, yeah, but I think that's going to change pretty quickly. Um, other competition of a less political nature. There is a project called End Time D by a guy named Camp. Uh, it's, a, it's still basically a research project, a laboratory toy. He's trying different ways of doing time sync. Um, 
he's um, not going to be ready for production for a while. It is possible, just possible, that MT MTIP might turn out to work better uh, than, than MTIP was. But if that's the case, it won't be apparent for a while. Um, and a lot of uh, people who run time servers are intensely conservative. They want the devil they know. They want the configuration language they're familiar with. They want a code base with a lineage that they understand. So I don't think NTPD, regardless of its technical merits, probably isn't going to make much headway for a while. Uh, there is also a, yeah? O OpenBSD's implementation? I was going to mention that next. Um, they have, OpenBSD has a time sync implementation. I don't know much about it except a couple of things, one of which is it doesn't actually do full NTP. It does a, a simplified version called Simple NTP. Uh, and the other thing uh, that it, and it can't, rec thus it can't, it can't really reconcile time from multiple servers. The other thing I know is that because of the way the, uh, the clock interface works in the BSDs, um, its ability to do fine-grained clock adjustments by slewing, I'll explain that in a moment, in a moment is limited. It's, uh, NTP can do a better job simply because of some things that the underlying platform makes available on Linux and most other systems that OpenBSD doesn't. Um, and now I should explain slewing. When you want to change a clock to resync it with uh, an external time source or your statistical composite of a bunch of external time sources, there are two ways you can do it. The obvious way is stepping. You say, well, I thought it was time x, now it's time y. So I'll just yank the clock, say it's, it's time y. In general, you don't want to do that. <laughs> that man is chuckling like he knows why. It's because, yeah, when you step the clock, especially if you step it backwards, that's big trouble. When you step the clock, user land tends to notice and really get upset. Um, on the other, the, the other way to do it, the way it's usually normally done, um, except it's just boot time, is by slewing the clock, which is to say, you figure out what, how, to, how you need to adjust the clock's frequency so that it will shortly resync to the correct time, and then you slew the frequency and you leave it there until it's tracking correct timing. That's the way it's normally done. Um, the system call interface for slewing the clock, changing its frequency, is extremely tricky and poorly documented. <laughs> this is one of the reasons these, these, these uh, time demons are such beasts to write and maintain. Uh, and one of the things I know is that um, OpenBSD's ability to do clock slewing is, um, well, it's there, but it's pretty crude. Next question. Not a question, but a, a comment about NTPQ. Um, when, if you wouldn't mind when you look at that, I don't care about any of the statistics. I just want to know that my damn time is synced and that it's actually working and that like somebody didn't change the firewall or ACL or some stupid thing and cut off my time because I've had that happen. So if some, and, you know, because there's, there's the Perl NTP trace, there's any number of stuff. Oh, we threw out all that crap. Right. So I don't care about that. I just want to know if my damn time right. Unfortunately, that's not an easy question to answer. Uh, the nature of the problem is that the, you well, get it. You get it. Does it is my hard. NTP you think it, it's it's working? It's, it's okay. Working. The way you look at that, the way you, the, the, the way you tell if your NTP thinks it's working is you do an NTP peers display, and you look at the list of servers, and you look at the jitter, the jitter column, the list of servers, and you ask yourself, is that jitter acceptably small? Because the jitter is the random variation. The, in, in the times that it's, it's getting from this. If the jitter is expect, acceptably small, then you're, get, you're getting relatively consistent time from the servers you're watching, and your time is probably good. If you have large variation in jitter, you're going to have some problems. Right. Well, what I want is just a, as a, you know, like a Nagios, something Nagios can run and just say, is the damn time right? You know, encapsulate it. doesn't have a well defined answer. It's, it, it's a gradient, it's, it's blobby. What's good enough for, for some contexts may not be good enough for others. And trying to reduce the behavior of, of, of end time servers over NTP peers to a single figure of merit, it's not really clear how to do that. I, I, I thought it was, 
If your local time was off too far, it would not adjust. That's true. So, so what's the easy way to tell if you're off too far? I mean, that's what I think what there's no way to tell. Yeah, how do you tell you're off well, too when far? When that happens, you're in a vacuum. You're no, floating the space. The software has decided I'm not going to adjust because it's too because it's too far off. So the software knows that it's too far off. Why can't it tell you that? I think I think what people are asking for is in addition to uh, the jitter related to individual uh, external uh, NTPs, a consolidated jitter number. And then you can pick what Oh, I see. Where, 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 is, where you want set to Set an alarm be. when the jitter goes over a threshold. Well, you can set the alarm. But I understand what you're saying in, in that there's no defined jitter. This is a good jitter. This is a bad jitter. Right. But you can consolidate the jitter into a single number and allow the customer to decide this this is an acceptable I, I am I'm not, I'm not confident to give you an immediate answer on that. But right, I but think be. about it. What I will do is I will go back to Gary Miller and I will bounce this idea off him. And he will either reject it with scorn or go, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something like fundamentally stupid, but just give it an exit code of representing that, that single number. You don't want it to exit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 exactly. Not an NTP, NTPQ. Yeah. Like I said, all I want to know is I want a simple way to a whole bunch of servers and make sure that some idiot didn't screw up the firewall rules and I can't get time because that keeps oh. somebody used Oh, hey, insane. if this firewall rules will screw it up, well, there won't be any peers showing up in your peers display. Right. That's really simple. With my peer but I might, depending on how tiered it is, like I might be getting some, but then they're cut off. So I'm, I'm you know, okay. like one, one of the things you see these ways, I'm, I'm on stratum 16, okay, I know, I'm not saying don't screw it. But if, if I'm like five, six, seven, eight. If you see peers that are not in your local domain, domain, you're right. good. Your firewall isn't fucked. Right. <laughs> J JP, don't you don't you run a local uh, time server? Don't you? I do. This is work stuff that I can't control. They they won't let you run a local time server at. The Monday. Dude, I, no, let's just not even go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't trust you or what? By the way, would you trust them? No, 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 you know what the budget, budget for a production ready um, Strata 1 time server is these days? About 80 bucks. Is what you do. You get a Raspberry Pi 3. You put a, a, a GPS or Ubertronics GPS hat on it, on the, on the extension connector. You string an antenna to the nearest window, or you just put it near a window. You're done! <laughs> and then put a TP sign on it. <laughs> that would be good how to. Uh, that would be good how to. Uh, in fact, it already exists. Uh, I have written a Stratum 1 microserver how to, which has not formally gone 1.0 because of it's, it's done, but it hasn't gone formally 1.0 and been announced because of some procedural stuff we have to get, we have to get done first. But okay, so that will, did your blog link log yet? <clears throat> yeah, it will be announced. That will be announced shortly, probably along with uh, something approximating the release schedule. Next. If you're converting all the Python, what's your concern with external libraries and change from Python 2 to Python 3? Ah, well, one of the this project has had a number of interesting spin-offs. One of the spin-offs of this project is I got approached by a guy named Peter Dennis, who who uh, knows Python even better than I do. I pushed to admit. I mean, and I'm pretty good. Um, and uh, Peter looked at my code and, and, and scratched his mug and, and talked to me about it. And we eventually came up with a, with a, a how-to, which you can find out there, uh, called Practical Python Porting for Systems Programmers. And it is about how to make your Python code what we call polyglot, that is able to run without change under two or three, which would be trivial except for the problems of handling binary data. They get nasty when you have to deal with the transition between uh, Python 2 strings, which are byte sequences, and Python 3 sequences, which are Unicode points. There is a way around this. It depends on using Latin 1 encoding as a hack to represent high half binary data. And it turns out once you've had this idea, you can package up all the grotty stuff 
into a fairly small set of definitions and functions and include it in each one of your files and with a big comment that says, this is how you do polyglot. And uh, in the how-to, Peter and I give a very, very detailed recipe for how to do this. And every single piece of Python code in NTPSec, where it matters, follows this recipe. So yes, we are Python. We are Python three capable, and we test that. Next, on the same vein, have you checked any external library that you're using for the same problem? Same problem. Oh, external Python libraries. We're not using anything that isn't in the standard distribution. Okay. So as long as that's important, but, you know, we won't let that breaking the internet. Yes. <laughs> Uh, now, if it isn't in the standard distribution, I, 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 I roll it up myself. I actually had an instance of that today. Um, I had a, a problem where one of the things I'm working on now is finishing the NTPQ translation. And I realized that I needed a whole bunch of really grotty bit extraction macros to look at incoming NTPQ packets. And, and, and the first thing I did was I like, I. I lifted them by hand out of the C header file where they lived, and I dropped them in the Python module and I turned them into Python. And I looked at that and said, boy, is this a recipe for horrible bugs down the road when these files desynchronize. This is not acceptable. So what I spent today uh, doing is writing a little utility called Pythonize header, which looks at a, a C header full of macro definitions and things. And with some reasonable restrictions, turns it into an equivalent set of Python definitions. And that, that's, as of this afternoon, that's integrated into our build system. So if that C header ever changes, boom, Python becomes correct on the next build. And you don't, you don't leave stuff like that to be done by hand. That's just asking for trouble. <laughs> next question. What are your thoughts on the iPhone NTP uh, issue? iPhone NTP? If you want to show an NTP and you set the date to 1970 and fix the iPhone? It's not an NTP problem, it's always a problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. My response to all such questions is closed source software, you're asking for trouble. There you go, Next. Not to go down the rabbit hole on this one, but uh, the but license for NTPSec, because I know NTP was kind of on its own unique license, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, we're keeping, we have an unresolved sort of dual license situation where for historical reasons, part of the code is under the University of Delaware NTP license. The rest of it, all our, on all our new stuff, it's BSD2 clause. Um, and our intent is to move to BSD2 clause as rapidly as possible. This is only a technical problem since there are both permissive licenses. Next. Good, I bored everybody in call. <laughs> <laughs> It's not NTP-sec related, but yeah. are you still doing any work on uh, Repo Surgeon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do I get to talk for another hour about Repo Surgeon now? Sure. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> By all means. It's your talk. You can say what yeah. you want to talk about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're here for him. Mute <laughs> all phones, please. I'll take two phones at once, though. So, <laughs> how many people here know about Repo Surgeon? More than I expected. Uh, <laughs> for the rest of you, Repo Surgeon is a one of a kind creature. It's a, it's a big honk of Python program. I like writing big honk of Python programs. Um, the big honk of Python program modeled on, I kid you not, Ed, <laughs> that reads an entire version control repository into itself and lets you edit the graph, change comments, uh, delete or modify commits, do various other kinds of things to the metadata. You can, you can break a repository apart into pieces. You can take pieces of the repository and stitch them together. Uh, 
that pretty much any surgical operation you can imagine, a repo surgeon is going to let you do, provided that at some level your repository uh, engine can speak um, uh, Git fast import format. I'm seeing the wrong faces. So let me tell you about this wonderful technology, which I, I, the moment I looked at it, I thought, oh my god, these people do not understand what they have invented. Um, Git, when they, it was trying to get established, um, had a problem, which was that they wanted other people to migrate their code, their repositories to Git. But repository translators are notoriously difficult to write. And it would have required people writing translators from version control system foo to trans version control system to Git to know a great deal about the internals of Git. And nobody wants to learn about the internals of Git. So <laughs> I, I do. believe you, believe me, I don't want to learn about the internals of Git. The, the, the user interface is entirely bad enough. Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the Git guys had a really, really clever idea. He wrote a, a, he designed a file format with the property that it's a plain, flat, textual format in which you can express all of the history and metadata of a live Git repository. Uh, and the, we, the reason he did this was he said, you don't have to write an exporter from your version control system that knows about Git's internals. All you have to do is write an export that can generate this file format, and then the importer that I wrote will eat it and turn it into a Git repository. And I looked at this back in 2010 and I said, these people do not understand what they have invented. They have invented an interchange format for repository histories. Wow, that's a big deal. And I started thinking about things you could do with that interchange format. And I asked myself the question, wait, if I wrote a structure editor for this thing, I'd have a repository editor, and I might also have the best repository translation program going anywhere. And both of those predictions turned out to be true. In particular, if you need to move a subversion repository to Git, the fastest and most effective way to do it is repo surgeon, because one of the things I gave repo surgeon the ability to do is read subversion dump files. Feed repo surgeon a subversion dump, it goes pak -ta -pak -ta -pak -ta -pak -ta, and it turns it into deserialized Git structures, which it can then write out as a, a Git dump or create as a Git repository. And in fact, uh, Reaper Surgeon now speaks a whole bunch of different um, uh, version control systems because it will talk to any version control system that it has um, that it has front ends or back ends for that will speak this format. So it will take content from Subversion, CDS, Bazaar, if that matters anymore. Bazaar is pretty much dead. Yeah, I still like that one too. Uh, uh, yes, uh, 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 Subversion. CDS, Bazaar, a couple of other weird ones like Monotonic. Uh, also, um, Mercurial. Fossil, Mercurial too, yeah. Uh, pretty much everything we'll take input from. And we'll do output to Git or Mercurial or actually Subversion, but that's more stunt than anything else because it's a round trip. Uh, one of the properties that the three core surgeon has is if you read in a Git uh, a repository and you do nothing and you write it out again, you get exactly the same meta metadata. Round tripping is lost. Um, and uh, if you happen to have a big, messy repository conversion going on, this thing has a thousand uses. Um, one of the things I, I need to work on right uh, in, in a couple months is. I thought they had gotten it done, but it turned out they didn't. The, um, the, the GCC people, the last big conversion I did was Emacs. Uh, the GCC people are trying to move their repository from Subversion. And I thought they had gotten it finished, but they haven't. So I have to go back and fix some bugs and help them get through that conversion. 
Uh, and after that, the FreeBSD people want to move from CDS to, to Git. Uh, and they have internal procedural and bureaucratic problems, you wouldn't believe. I'm waiting for them to like give the go ahead because I've got a, I, I have a CDS mirror of their repository. And basically, the moment they say yes, I will push a button and a Git repository will come out. Uh, because of repo search, and I also maintain um, a couple other programs, one of them is a CDS fast export, which does exactly what we think it does. It takes a CDS repository and turns it into a, 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 a Git fast export stream. With some caveats, because CDS is horrible. <laughs> I mean, it is deeply, deeply rotten. Uh, it can get into all kinds of pathological cases where you can't make any, any sense out of it, and the smartest computer program in the world can't either. And so there are some, some cases in which, um, in which CDS fast export will barf, and extremely recondite manual intervention will be required. And if anybody but an open source project ever asks me to do that, they're going to pay me <laughs> Because that work is painful. Uh, and that's sort of the general rant about repo search. Did anyone have specific questions? About repo searching or just in general? Just in general. I'm still, I'm still here for 45 minutes. So. <laughs> uh, so we have a request, actually, from someone else. Um, <laughs> we have to yell out good and loud, auto tools must die. Auto tools must die! <laughs> Uh, one of the things we did on NTPSEC is we're not using auto tools anymore. Um, I've been through a, a couple of different build systems trying to find one that I like. For a while I was a big fan of SCONS. I used that on GPSD and that worked pretty well, but um, it's slow and the maintenance team is kind of sluggish. They don't respond to bug reports and feature reports very well. Uh, we went a different route for NTPSEC. We used a um, a system called WAF, um, which I understand Sambo also uses it, a couple of other high profile projects using it. WAF is wonderful in all respect, uh, respects except one. Um, it's, um, the recipes are very compact and expressive. Uh, build performance is incredible. It builds amazingly fast. Um, the one serious problem that it has, and the maintainer is quite responsive, the one serious maintainer, the one serious problem it has is the documentation is horrible. Uh, there's a thing called the WAF book, and it has a lot of information in it, but it might as well be written in ancient Sanskrit. <laughs> you really cannot understand the WAF book until you don't need to understand the WAF book. Uh, that's, that's its only problem, but that's a really major one. Uh, I don't know when somebody is going to pierce that darkness in the fog. Uh, but we've gotten to the point where we've got a WAF build that works and we really, really like it. And to give you an idea of the compression ratio, we went from 31 megabytes of auto tools crap that didn't really work quite right to a single megabyte of build recipe that was somewhere around 100 times faster. Yeah, like that. So yeah, auto tools must die. <laughs> Next. Anybody? Anybody? All right. All right. I guess, I'll, right I guess I'll press the button. Go for it. Um, somebody, somebody on, on IRC has another question um, uh, about Rust. If you if you have ever touched it, and what are your thoughts on it, and, and if you would actually th do think of doing anything in it. I am thinking about it. I really am. Uh, I have been aware for a couple of years that I'm reaching the limits of what I can do with the languages that I work in, which are primarily C and Python. We all know what their strengths are. C is the lingua franca of systems programming, but it's still tremendously useful. But we all know how hard it is to build uh, truly reliable and secure code using C. 
I could rant about that in a bit for a bit. I will in a moment. Uh, but once I'm done with this question. Um, so, I mean, C has that fundamental limit. You spend a lot of your time doing low level resource management. It's difficult to get that right, and the difficulty opens up a road to a lot of defects and security bugs. And this is a serious problem. And there's Python. I love Python. I use Python for everything that doesn't force me to use C. And what forces me to use C is a requirement for, uh, for uh, near real-time performance. When, when, max, when maximum cycle utilization is a problem, I bust out my C chops. Um, I love Python. It's a very expressive language. It's brilliant for both product, prototyping and production work. Um, I've written a lot of what I, I believe is very good code in it. Um, it has two problems. One is not all that serious, actually. The, un the, the not all that serious problem is that it's a slow performer relative to C and relative to other scripting languages. Uh, even, it's slower even than Perl by a significant, significant margin. Um, normally, I don't care. I don't tend to use it for applications in which that kind of performance is an issue. Uh, occasionally, that problem rears its ugly head. Um, and it would not be a major difficulty in the slow performance if not for Python's second huge issue, which is the global interpreter lock. Normally, the way you would get around the slow runtime performance in language like that is you would figure out how to break your, your, uh, your uh, code into things that are parallelizable. And then you would hand off subjobs with some kind of divider and, and conquer strategy to multiple processors. And Subject to the major reason Amdahl's law, you could pretty much make things go as fast as you need to. The problem is Python has this really annoying limitation of a global interpreter lock that means that for, um, for software that is limited by sh simply by shuffling the speed of shuffling things around in memory, you cannot parallelize. You can only do it for things that block on I.O. or network weights, uh, which render the, the global interpreter lock irrelevant. This bites me right in the ass where repo is concerned. There are very expensive operations, some of which are extreme, extremely simple, such as dumb things like take this email address everywhere in the metadata credentials and replace it with this other updated email address, which on a repository the size of GCC can be a very expensive operation, even with a fast machine. Ideally, what we would like to do is a Hadoop-like thing where we partition the repo into M segments and assign one thread to doing that change on, on every segment. Can't do it. The great interpreter lock prevents you. The global interpreter lock prevents you. So I'm finding that as much as I love Python, I'm running on a fundamental, into a fundamental limitation on its inability to parallelize certain kinds of problems which is forcing me to look at the uh, two other languages. And the two other languages that I'm looking at, one of them is Rust, and the other, which I'm probably not going to survive, su surprise anybody by saying this name, is Go. Go so I've looked at both of them, and they both excite me and fill me with unease. <laughs> I look at Go, and I think, this looks really nice, and it looks a lot like compiled Python, and I'd love to translate uh, uh, repo surgeon into this and, and be able to like really parallelize stuff and collect the, the, the speed benefit from compilation and so forth. Except there's this anno really annoying problem that it doesn't have catchable exceptions. That's that's my, my blocker in Go. That's the missing feature that would make the, the large Python programs I have very difficult to translate because um, I depend on catchable exceptions and I make heavy, heavy use of the sort of RAII idiom in uh, Python, which I really like, which is uh, context managers. Anybody here know, know about that? There's a way you could say in Python, if you have your class appropriately constructed, you can say, my favorite example of this is where you say with critical region, critical region being a, 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 a class, and then you hang a block off that with. And what happens is when you start the block, critical region goes in and says, oh, I'm a contact manager. manager. I'm going to run the enter method. And the enter method will mask off a bunch of signals in this case. 
And then however the block is executed, the, uh, the, the class will go back to its, its underscore exit underscore method mode and run that. However the block is executed, uh, even, if you, even if you throw an exception. When you exit the block, the exit code will run and it will unmask all those signals. And this is a great thing for any situation where you have to maintain some kind of critical resource. And you not only want to allocate it right, but you want to guarantee that deallocation happens correctly, no matter how you exit the context where the resource is being used. The with class, in, the with contact manager idiom is great for that. Only Python has it. I love it. Go won't do that and can't do it. And that's really annoying. Uh, you asked about Rust. I've also looked at Rust. Rust, it's a whole bunch of good ideas. I'm not sure it's a decent production language yet. Um, there was a review I saw of it which kind of crystallized a bunch of my doubts um, in which the reviewer observed Rust cannot decide whether it wants to be an imperative language or a functional one. Uh, on the one hand, it superficially looks a lot like an imperative language in the, in the style of what C would be like if you designed it in the 21st century. On the other hand, there's no for loops. There's only these iterator objects that are kind of like a, some kind of refugee from Erlang or OCaml land. Uh, and the reviewer correct, observed correctly, I think, that, that because Rust is caught between these two fires and not be quite being con a conventional imperative language, and not quite being a fully functional one, it can't quite be good enough at either yet. So I think they still have some fundamental rethinking to do before I'm going to be ready to use Rust. There's also the irritating thing, the fact that there are like, there's like five different ways of boxing data for memory management. There's too many distinctions there. It's like, it's like the visibility stuff in, in Java. It's over-engineered. It needs to be simpler. Is that a reasonable answer? Yeah, so yeah, I, I mean, I mean, he's not gonna he's not gonna see it until uh, until the video goes off. So. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we're asking you a question in relay, and we're not gonna know. know that how was over the, IRS, the question yeah. is gonna be answered well enough. <laughs> so that was me thinking about uh, going. <laughs> I had a you you sort of triggered a delayed rant on uh, engineering for zero defects. All right. Hey, bring it. Yeah. Hey, look. I'm good for something. <laughs> this is, uh, well, this was actually, it's a previous question about, uh, I don't remember what it was, but uh, this is something I've been very concerned with um, for a number of years, first on GPSD, where, you know, this is, started out as this fun project where let's write a GPSD monitor, GPS monitor, so I could put it on my laptop and, like, word drive around mapping um, Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, and then it turned into this really cool system design pro, uh, problem that I spent several years on. And I'm really starting to get the code to the point where I want it, and I'm designed to the point where I think it's really good. And this, I suddenly realized that it's being used for all kinds of life critical stuff. Uh, the same friend who put together the NTP set team told me at one point, hey Eric, did you know that your software is part of the IFF system on every armored fighting vehicle in the U.S. military? <laughs> 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 I'm terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a few months after a friend of mine who's a marine biologist told me that GPSD was heavily used in the guidance systems for the underwater robots that were used in the Deepwater Horizon cleanup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether that was before or after I found out that GPSD was being used by essentially every driverless car prototype in the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> this real world feedback comes in and I, I realized, um, you know, I, I think I'd better start getting serious about reliability and zero defects here. 
This might be important. <laughs> it might just be important. <laughs> I've been sort of moving in that direction anyway, and I got really systematic about it. Uh, and one of the consequences is um, one of the most amazing things about GPSD, in my humble opinion, is our regression test suite. Um, every time we get a new device, every time we get a new bug from a, a device data transcript, I collect that data, the output from that GPSD or that sensor or that AIS radio, whatever it is. And I store it, and I have this, um, this program called GPS Fake. It's a Python program. See what happened here? Uh, and what it does is Python creates a controlled environment around an instance of GPSD and feeds it data streams as though they were coming from GPSs and watches what it does. And you can, you can use this to check that the same data stream from the GPS always gives the same stable JSON output that would be seen by a user land application. <clears throat> so at this point, I have over 100 reg regression tests for like 80, at least 85 different kinds of devices. And <clears throat> every time we make a change, we run that regression test and we make sure it doesn't break. We also do other things. Uh, we use covariety scanning systematically. Um, we, uh, we, we use one other static analyzer. We used to use uh, 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 estimate, but that was just too much of a pain in the ass, and it's unmaintained, so we got rid of it. We also we use one name for C++ that I forget the name of. So we use two different static analyzers. We have a huge regression test suite. We have coding practices such as no malux ever to eliminate entire classes of errors. Um, when I was asked to be the project lead for NTPSEC, I decided to be even more systematic about it, to the point where we have a hacking guide in the distribution that tells you a list of functions you must not use ever. And of course, this includes all of the unsafe string functions. Don't do it. For each one of you, we, for each one of the unsafe string functions, we give you a function or an idiom that's a safe alternative that won't do unbounded memory access. And you are required to use this if, if, we, if we find you using an unsafe function, we come to your house and kick you repeatedly in the shins. Very mild. I assume that's only first defense. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For a second defense, you are left with melts. Um, you make so, it appear squawk. So, the, uh, so one of the themes in uh, NTPSEC has been we've adopted practices not just to, to fix bugs, but to prevent bugs from ever happening. Ban on safe C functions. Uh, have a, a very, uh, again, we have a very systematic testing. We have build bots doing code washing constantly. And one of the takeaways from both projects is that <clears throat> I think most people who write in C are running on old mental habits in one important respect. We accept as inevitable a defect rate which is much higher than we could actually get if we were trying. It doesn't, in, on, on NTPSEC and on GPSD, we go entire months, sometimes we've gone entire three month stretches without anybody reporting a new bug on the tracker. This is in software that's used on you know, 14 different operating systems, literally with billions of deployments for, where GPSD is concerned, your Android phone, for example. Uh, and we go, we go months at a time without new bugs on the tracker. Uh, and it's not because it ain't being used, and it's not because we don't get bug reports. We do get bug reports. They're just really rare. But they tend to be pretty high quality when we get them, actually. Um, so, and, and NTPSEC has a similarly low, low defect rate. Uh, we, again, we've gone for entire three month stretches where, where we didn't have the bugs turn up. Um, and this, you can achieve this kind of def low defect rate with C. And part of the news I am here to bring is that this, this isn't magic. You can do it. You just have to be really systematic about all the good practices you already know. Work. But you know what? It's worth it 
because you spend so much time, less time actually debugging that you get to do fun stuff. And that's actually, I would say that's probably a good note to wrap up on. So thank you for listening to me. What's the defect rate, in other words, the, you said you were a seed program in all the good practices for lack of a better word. What's, is it like 10 parts per million? In other words, 10 lines per uh, million lines of code? 10 errors per million lines of code? I've never laid that way of describing it because it doesn't include the time element well, defect yeah, frequency. Huh? Yeah, you have to add per unit of time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so to give you a ballpark figure, um, GPSD is about 40k long, I think. Um, NTPSEC is 72k long. Um, if you figure that we if you figure we're at we're getting an average uh, bug report rate of, oh, I'd say the average is once every 45 days or so. You can do the math yourself. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. to start in TPSEC or if you already had? Uh, that would have been right around the time, about the time I was beginning work. I, I remember you were talking about it. I couldn't remember if you said you'd actually started yet or not. Yeah. I think that may have been the point at which I was still working on the repository conversion. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a whole other epic point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just say one word and, and leave you to imagine the horror that was involved. Big keeper. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have a little bit more time left, about 45 minutes or so, before the scheduled ending of the plug last. Uh, if anybody has any questions or wants to talk about anything, they're more than welcome to. Uh, I know that the scheduled speaker has finished and has probably spoken more than he cared to. <laughs> Just be That's all right. You can still throw questions at me as long as they ask it. But if anybody has anything they want to talk about or have questions about or something they're working on or something nifty they're doing, please, by all means, let's hear about it. No? Well, look at me, I ain't done anything interesting in weeks. Weeks, he says, weeks, weeks. How about that media server? <coughs> yeah, you should get up there and talk about that. No, I say, I'm, I'm here actually now. tearing that whole thing apart and redoing it because my plans have changed. Really? So, so the, the pre preliminary talk you saw here was the only instance of that as it was. Well, you and Cheryl were the cheese. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, when, when today's 1.0 becomes the next project 0 0.1. You and Cheryl's bad yeah. Just uh, I'll take one of those. Anybody else? So um, what we usually do is we go to the office afterwards. Uh, it's a good time usually. We're not in the office one. We go to the office. It's a little restaurant right around the corner. Um, if anyone wants to go, let me know. And we'll head over that way. Uh, if you have a minute, though, I'd like to you know, just pose a question. Who here has a certification of some kind? Shortly, right? Huh? You're short, right? What am I? You're going to get this done. So uh, I gave a talk at uh, Central about some certifications. And one of the questions I had was, is, do you feel like your certification helps you in your job? Do you feel like it helps you? It, it used to. Um, not, I'm not entirely sure it still does, but uh, the one I'm thinking of, because I, I used to have all the Microsoft ones and Nobel ones way back when. One I'm actually thinking of, yeah. It's like being a certified subject engineer. Exactly. <laughs> 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 I 
Public sewage like nobody does. Those are professional certified licenses. I'm certified. And 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 And I'm certified. 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 And I'm
it's basically nice to see things on paper. Yeah, but that doesn't mean anything because it's a piece of paper. Well, who well, here? No one ever lies on a resume. Good lord, man. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 I worked in the space shuttle, and uh, you know, uh, NASA was, uh, you know, hired. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who here has actually had to get a cert to keep their job? Besides Andy. <laughs> Nobody. Uh, when I asked that question at Central, there were a couple people who raised their hand. They said, "Yeah, I had to get certified by Microsoft. I had to do this and that." It was surprising, really, to me that you know, a company would require you. That's not a consultant company to have a certification. So that leaves us about 35 minutes to go. Anybody have anything to talk about? Anyone? The floor is officially open. Well, reading into some of the certifications, and I saw that uh, OSCP, Offensive Security, yeah. and wrote, for help that wrote about some, read about somebody went through it. It really seems rather intense. Is that better than any of the others? Yes. It's a 24-hour test, and if you yes. take that, and then, I mean, yeah. you're, that's not one of those ones where you go and you take an open book test, and if you pass it, then you're certified. It's an actual, like, they sit you down, and you have 24 hours to, to gain access. Um, you have to gain access and then clear access or something like that? Is that right? Uh, I think there's two service. levels. There's one that's 20, was it 24 hours, and there's one above that that I think is, I think is 48 it's like a three, it's like a two I'm not day. Sure. The only one I've heard about is a twenty four hour one. But that's the first. Yeah, that's the basic test. Yeah, is twenty four hours. That's the easy one. Yeah, that's the easy but one, you, right? Yeah, if you take this test, you can safely go to anyone's. Offensive security. Test. They call Kali Linux. Something you can you can cheat, so to speak. I mean, you, you, there's ways about that, I'm sure. But so there are certs, and then there are certs. I mean, we yeah, all have the list, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the week long course you go to, and at the end of it, you're certified. And there's the ones where you go and you take a test, and you're certified. You know, so. Yeah, to answer your question, if someone had that, that's a, that's, I mean, that's like the real deal. That'll, that'll raise an eyebrow. That'll be like, oh. If you're asking for 30K with that, then you have no idea what you're worth. <laughs> the problem is a lot of people don't know about that test, though. True. You talk, you talk to people in government, they're still looking at what is C, uh, C, I, S, S, P, or yeah. some of the older ones out there. And you, you mention offensive security, and, and they go, well, what do you mean? I'm not being offensive. <laughs> you know, they, they just, a lot of people don't know about some of these, uh, that's the most rigorous certification I know about for, like, technical stuff. Uh, are the VMware ones pretty intense, the I, I, You know me, I don't do certifications, I don't know. <laughs> well, I never take the higher up ones, well, the, the BCP especially, mm -hmm. it's difficult, and then as you get higher up, the, a lot of the a, a, a ones are dealing with the design, which is all soft knowledge, not... And then a lot of them have labs where you actually not just have to know the answer, you have to be able to configure a wide environment. So I prefer that kind of test, honestly, over okay. sitting down in front of a book and say, okay, here's 50 questions, and there's going to be multiple choice, and then there's going to be two and three part questions, and then there's going to be full in the blanks, and I don't know. That's not, to me, that's not knowledge, that's memorization. I'd rather sit in front because of Because you do have to do the first one before you can move on to the advanced sure. lab ones, you have to do the first one. Sure. Some of the Cisco, the Cisco tests were a big deal back in the day because of that. You know, for CCIE, that was like you know, 15 years ago. That was sort of a premier certification you got because it was lab based. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the Red Hat ones used to be like that. I got certified years ago, and I'm here taking the. They still are. Yeah, because uh, we talked about that essential. Oh, okay. um, yeah, they're still pretty intense. Yeah, yeah the CCIE ones are still like that too. Uh, like yeah. a it's actually funny because when I got my the, the Linux professional one, yeah. uh, you have to it's it's you have to go up to the nearest one was Allentown, so I had to go up to Allentown. Took the certification, it was all practical, you know, set up SSH keys, really easy stuff. Um, but it's graded automatically. So when you hit submit, it takes the VMs that you've created and it goes through the checklist of all the things you should have done, like 40, 50, 60 things. And if you didn't do it the way that they thought you did it, it failed you. And then it right. happens so much at the end of it, you can actually, there's a button that says, okay, well, I, I failed it, and I almost had a heart attack when I failed it because I got everything right, it was really easy. But I got like a 25%. <laughs> and there's a big button that says, ask for manual grading. So I click the button, 
and then four to six weeks later they said, hey, you got 100% uh, because <laughs> the, the regex that they used to look at the files and stuff like that wasn't exactly correct and uh, some uh, manual uh, human had to go through and well, look at it. That's what I was saying. I muttered under my breath of the, that's great on the labs that's as long as they're graded so appropriately. Right. Automated grading systems are going to yeah. do that. <laughs> Yeah. That, that's, it. that's what Anthony was talking about. Uh, one, one of the guys from Central, he said he took a test and he hit the button and the framework for the test was broken. <laughs> so they, so they could, he couldn't actually submit the test. It, they were so the guy was, who built the test needed to be certified. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. <laughs> and that was, he wasn't certified. He <laughs> but that was one of the problems. It's, it's, it reminded me of something. Oh, this is my current side project. Yeah. Um, I, um, I have a standing off route, which you should all know about, which is that anybody, for anybody who will send me a sufficiently detailed specification of a sufficiently old, weird, bizarre computer language, I will run a million volts through its methods and make it live again. <laughs> because I like working interpreters and compilers. Uh, I have a project like that going on right now. It used to be used at, as and with an automated grading system. It's the first string processing language ever written. It's from 1957. It's called CODIT. And it is almost unthinkably bizarre. It's like intercal taking itself seriously. Uh, I'm, I'm most of the way through writing the interpreter now. And let me see if I can convey. The, the, the subroutine instruction actually has you specify a return label, and in some cases, two return labels. I don't quite get what the second label is. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you need it. I always done the language itself, but in these jumped up comments called routing instructions, um, the storage the program has available to it is organized as shelves, 127 of them, and they're essentially arrays of strings. And there's a whole set of weird instructions for shuffling data back and forth between the strings and between the, the, the shelves of the workspace. The memory model, this is not a flat storage memory model. It's very strange compared to anything you've ever run into. Uh, I, I'll release it shortly. And you're, you will read this manual and your head will hurt. What did it run on? Uh, it ran on an IBM 70, 704 dash process. The manual that I'm using was written in 1971 and published in 1972. And I would be very surprised if it's seen any use since then. <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, the oldest computer in use by the federal government has been found, an old punch card machine used by the IRS. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, that just made you. Oh yeah, no, they, they, they maintain contracts with disaster recovery companies to maintain punch card readers. Sure. Oh yeah, I, mean, I was wandering around a site down, SunGuard site down in uh, Smyrna, Georgia, and uh, there's a whole wing that has little windows, but you're not allowed to go anywhere near it. I'm able to, 2 a.m. because it's a 40 hour run, and I'm sitting, so I'm just wandering the building trying to break into the rooms because, you know, what the hell else am I going to do at 3 in the morning? <laughs> and um, I'm sort of in there. Smoking like a true hacker. I'm looking at it, I'm, I'm sort of, I find one of the texts, and I'm like, what is in that wing? It's the biggest part of this building. It's a giant room, and I can see sort of hulking monsters in the corner. Perhaps I'm hallucinating from lack of sleep. Perhaps something interesting. He's like, technically, I can't tell you anything about that room. Come back in 15 minutes. I'll be on break. <laughs> and uh, so I come back in 15 minutes with the appropriate bribes of coffee and candy. And uh, he's like, yeah, those are all punch card readers of various, I mean, specific models, years, yeah. and it, you know, the equivalent of firmware, whatever that would be in a card reader, for God's sake. Gears. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, what the thickness of card will take. And it's, yeah, it's all federal government, and they need, they, they've got contracts that they will keep X number of these machines in various places. 
in case. Well, who, when I told someone back then was to take the last punch card out. I, I one of, my father was a was a psych professor, so a psych professor in the seventies, and probably the only time I got close to a beating was one time I accidentally like stumbled over one of his boxes of punch cards. <laughs> they were unnumbered. Truly, <laughs> 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 as an adult, I'm like, screw you. That was your mistake. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Oh. That would be terrible. Yeah. Well, yeah. Again. So uh, anybody see that Snowden is working with someone to create a phone case that monitors, um, let's see what's the right word for it, um, that, that detects monitoring? I wonder how he's going to implement that. And it passes the traffic on to the FSB. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> the same way they're making fingernail polish that can detect movies and things. Uh. things. That is intriguing. I like that idea. How do you know about that, Jeff? Tell us more. <laughs> 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 How do you know about this? He needs to be careful when he goes out. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. 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 He needs to know how to pause it. Yeah. Well, I just Facebook. I'd love to see a prototype of that, of that phone case, you know, and see how it works. Materials engineering for the win. I don't know. I don't. How would that work? It's exterior, so you're routing signals through the phone case and into the phone and then back out again? Or? It doesn't make sense to me. It sounds more like, I don't know, scary. Yeah, apparently, I have aluminum foil that will protect you from all Right. Oh, I just, that actually I just reminded me so of. Scary. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Some segues don't really work. So, so somebody, <laughs> in the story for our our heads, the orbital mic control lasers can't reach us here. <laughs> but I feel like say otherwise. <laughs> So somebody, so earlier today, somebody on Reddit posted an article. Um, so it was something about how the how like people should get over the um, over like the Chinese manufacturers like you know taking Kickstarter ideas and just like and actually making them before the original the original Kickstarter like founder actually would oh, wow, make this them is a themselves. Thing? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and then it was like I'm surprised. No, no, it's like no, like the the article like the the point of the article is like. Was, was was basically just like everybody should get over this because you're not going to stop them. But also it's like, but also like the um, the article itself actually kind of kind of drew some parallels with with um, with open source software development in a way, even though it's hardware they're dealing with. Because yeah. like the Legenda, there's like it's like a whole it, it's it's a whole ecosystem of like tiny hardware manufacturers. Like they're all making different parts, but it's like but they're all coming together somehow, just like how. You know, so how somebody, how somebody back in '91 just posted on the Minix mailing list, and just like, I'm looking for some help with my kernel, All right? '91 or '94? What? '91. Minix? You said Minix, right? '91. '91. '91. Yeah. Somebody, somebody posted on, somebody posted on, I might have been using it actually. Just like, I'm looking for some help with my kernel. Uh, just. You know, just just a hobby project, just for fun. I think we all know what we're talking about, though. No, no idea. It won't ever be big like Multics. Weird. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was yeah, yeah. that was. Well, it's just like the people. It was a pen that said only three people people in the world would ever need a computer. <laughs> that was IBM. That was IBM. Okay. I think it was five. Yeah, that, yeah. I thought it was five. Or six. They largely were like every big city will need one. Nobody will ever need more than two hundred megabytes. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Uh, I'm going to say 640K is way too much as it is. That was tampering a little bit. And of course, if you have a Note 7, don't take it on an airplane. It's federally uh, it's it's a legal now. federal crime to take a Note 7 on an airplane. You know? Although, yeah, three weeks ago, when I was on before the second round of explosions, it was already like you were a pariah. Was, uh, there was literally, I mentioned a brand name in the announcement of make sure this unit is off and yeah. not connected to anything. Please, please don't burn up my now while we're fine. <laughs> what was this um, thing with Google? I heard this was this. I, I read something. I, well, I didn't read it. I saw it just flipping through it, and it said it was a release that said Google got a secret warrant from the FBI. Yes. And, I, and my first thought was, well, if it's a secret warrant, why are we talking? About it's it? a secret warrant. <laughs> because it's the FBI. From the gag order. 
Oh, okay. It's an old horn. They were released from the gag order, so they were able to yeah. talk about it. But also, they have canaries in place so that you can read right. the canary and be like, mm, something mm. happened, okay. but what I don't know the, precisely what was the horn. What, yeah, what was it about? I don't. I didn't read that much. Anymore. I don't think they were you know what? That. It's it's for iMessage. The FBI doesn't know where to go to. to oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Google Pixel has been announced. The Pixel XL. Who's gonna get one? People are some people like that shit. shit. <laughs> <laughs> is that the one that looks like an old iPhone? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And yeah, that's the one that looks like an old iPhone and runs even less open software than any Android handset. <laughs> yeah. Hello. 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 Yeah. Hello. The duo or the two yeah. big things. Yep. Sad that you met mod man for the way they yeah. that there will not be a desktop client for Allo. Period. Full stop. That sucks. Yeah. It, but so it's, now I mean, it's, it's now included in the default Android bundle. Mm -hmm. And Hangouts is depreciated and becoming uh -huh. a corporate messaging tool. Uh, quote unquote. Well, they just Jeez. released some new stuff for Hangouts. They did. That doesn't matter. So Hangouts is going like away. We have a future. I don't think so. I'll get rid of No, you said it's going corporate only. You said Hangouts is going corporate only and Allo's only going to be mobile? Uh, no. Allo is the new default messenger. Right. Up till now. If you wanted to ship Android, there was a list of apps that you had to include if you wanted any of Google's stuff. Right. Up till now, Hangouts has been on that list. Starting with the Pixel and moving forward, Hangouts is off the list, and Allo is on. <laughs> so every Android handset moving forward, pretty much, yeah. is going to have Allo on it. Hangouts is going to slowly be turned into a uh, corporate messaging tool. Like Slack or? Like Slack or Friends, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that combine that with there is no and will be no desktop tool for Allo. I, yeah, like, I don't you know what? Screw all this shit. Yeah, I, I don't understand that. Why would they remove the desktop client? Because they're silly. It's because in beta now, still. Now they've reloaded and realized there's foot left. And so they're going to continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. They, 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 they finished emptying the clip and they reloaded oh. and there's still yeah. foot. So, <laughs> yeah. I gotcha. How many signal users in the room? What's, how many what? Six signal. 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 Does it count if you're using WhatsApp? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I, I'm just asking because I'm a big fan of signaling. I right? use it for my secure comms these days. Mm -hmm. Nice interface. Uh, seems pretty reliable. I'm my problem with signal is that it lacks the ubiquity that Hangouts had. Yeah, Hangouts was I, insecure, but it was everywhere I went. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, Eric is more interested in yeah. security for this yeah. application. You've been secure tour or or any of those? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not an InfoSec person. I'm not competent to have opinions about stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know people oh, who are competent to have opinions, but I'm not one of them. Okay. I, I think that the, the issue with Signal was that they, uh, like for the people who really are worried about autonomy and security, oh, yeah. They, that they only like let you get it through the Play Store yeah. with their compiled binary. Uh, yeah, so if you want to do any kind of auditing or make yeah. sure that the code you're running is the code that they published, you're just kind of out of luck, and the like main maintainer kind of just said, "Fuck you if you care about that." So why don't we just go back to using? You know, I, I was a big fan of OpenFire and using Jabber stuff. Why don't we just people run their own IM stuff? I don't. Yes. Yeah. I got I got asked ask a question right about up. that by a client a couple of days ago. They're like, well, "What do you do for messaging?" I was like, "I all my entire everybody I talk to, all my team members, you guys, everybody's on Hangouts. Hangouts going away. Let's yeah. throw up the server and or actually, you know, IRC. But yeah. you know, yeah. for those of us that live that don't live in IRC, right. <laughs> when Google was all XMPP, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Great. yeah. yeah. I yeah. still I still awesome. use their XMPP even though they don't advertise it anymore. But uh, mm -hmm. SSL put the you know use the SSL stuff in there and you know you need communication for yourself. That's that's the way to go. Write it up. There's twelve people here. I guarantee you. We're, we're uh, my open fire server is up now. Yeah. <laughs> I would take a second to point out matrix. Matrix. There's an option on that one mm -hmm. oh. because it does have secure mode. It does have decentralized capability and it does have federation. So you can build a network through friends and social networks that you know is actually secure, run by, and verified through code. That well, gives you that as an option. Are they U.S. based? Yeah. Okay. Because the problem, of course, if they're U.S. based, they get a subpoena. They have to. No. You know. Yeah. No, no, no. You run your own. Yes. Decentralized. 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 It's completely distributed. That's why they don't operate in that way. It's not Telegram or. 
client is open source and the server is closed, it's here is everything. And this is how you hooked our node system up to IRC and Jabber and, and, and. They don't really have a lot of great clients right now. Um, no, they, they are definitely working on right that. They're, but they're working on it, yeah. They came out to Muscon last year. Right. Really? Yeah, they were just out here the year before. They were here the year before, yeah. two years ago. Yeah. Because I wasn't at the last Foscon, and they were there when I was there. Yeah. I'm thinking. Because I you're at the one, one. I got my jacket at the Friend Center from them. Yeah, Friend Center, yeah. Yeah, so they finished, three years. They finished twice. Last I meant 2015. Considering the retirement as I go and talk to you, I it, Yeah, I get you. Okay. Anybody going to B Billy this year? When is it? When is it? The first uh, week of December. Yeah. Uh, last week of December? First oh. week. Oh. Oh, what's this one? B Sides Billy? It's full. Registration is already full. There's no speakers or location or anything like that. Or no location, but oh, just go ahead and register back in June. Registration is already blocked out. <laughs> it's weird, man. There's no talks, but uh, registration is already full. So it'll be huge. PubCon is homeless. <laughs> Who's going to go to that? PubCon? Anyone? PubCon? No? I don't know what that is. What kind of PubCon? Oh. <laughs> I just know PubCon's homeless. Where did it used to be? It was homeless. Uh, Kyber Center. So to change the subject a little bit, has anyone heard about the big announcement between VMware and AWS? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, they're they're announcing co cooperation. So AWS is the biggest public cloud, and VMware struggling trying to get more. But their AWS is going to put in their new data centers ESX host running na native, and then not VMware nested. Right. Not not. A nested ESX, a native ESX host, and VMware is going to completely run their virtual cloud software that includes vCenter and NSX and vSAN. So basically, if, if you're co comfortable with the Annals and APIs and you want to do that, you, you can do that. If you have internal corporate applications, you're going to be able to run them. It's still going to be VMware managing it, but it's going to be running on the AWS cloud, which is worldwide, which has many more set sites than us. Do mid 2017 if, if you believe their scale. <laughs> um, they'll slip, but not, yeah, probably, probably not more than a quarter. But the thing is, so VMware, it's all software, right? So as long as you get the hypervisor, I, I think nested ESX does run sort of, but it's better to be on well, real hardware. I would say my understanding of it for the, for the TLDR summary was that basically now instead of using Amazon's proprietary stack, you can use VMware's proprietary stack. Correct. Same right. hardware, same location. And apparently, you know, I'll be very interested to see the pricing because, of course, you're running on AWS, which means you've got a Amazon wanting their piece of the pie, which is yeah. not a small piece of the pie. And, the, and VMware wanting their piece of the pie, which the is not a piece of the pie. VCloud software is expensive to run. And that, which is yet another piece of pie. But it is considered a private cloud, so I believe you can bring your own license if you're running. Yes, you can. That is Isn't one it of called VRealize? Realize? Is that what it's called? Well, VRealize Realize includes the monitoring software and all the man all the like other Like the metering and stuff like that? So B Cloud Director and all, I think all that stuff has stuff been lumped well together. And I don't know that they've really given the snazzy name yet. No, I know that there is something called VRealize. <coughs> yes, there is. It orchestrates stuff. It's just name changes. It's, yeah. it's repackaging yeah. things. Yeah. I know software has a similar deal going on there. The cloud provider, uh, the IBM purchase, and they have a similar VMware deal going through where they're they're pushing all of their VMware stuff. All right. Well, I think that's going to go ahead and conclude our discussion and talk tonight. Uh, if you want to go to the office, please let me know, and we can try to get a table. Uh, we get to get sort of the fastest. I don't know who does that. Where? But uh, if you want to go, please let me know and we'll get, uh, we'll get the table set up. It's a good time to be had over there. I don't know if you're going to be able to join us or not. We have a standing rule that the talk, the speaker of the talk does not have to pay for their dinner or beer. As far as I'm aware. Is that right, Jason? Is it within reason? Well, within reason, of course. If you can order $50 bottle of scotch, then I mean, like, oh, well, that's on him. You're off the hook. Yeah, oh, yeah. But the lobster. Anyway, the lobster. <laughs> so good. But well, now you're more than welcome to join us as well if you'd like to.
Can you run the corner? It's not that far away. Yeah, no worries. You need to follow? Okay. So if you'd like to go, please let me know. Other than that, this concludes our Club West meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank